Um, as I mentioned earlier, I attended the basic training in this field of functional medicine that I've sort of been looking at and wondering about uh, for a while uh, uh, this summer. And, um, and came away from that meeting, one, uh, shocked by how many family physicians were there, and I got to talk to a lot of them, and then how many family physician faculty were there. Uh, seven of the ten faculty were physicians. There was a general internist who was quite impressive, and there were uh, a couple of OBGYNs who were there also. Um, but we really need a, a, uh, a revolution in both family medicine and the rest of primary care around health. Um, because uh, the people that are migrating to functional medicine, they're kind of like expatriates, if you will. And uh, you know, one of the faculty was a core faculty at both in Philadelphia and then, I mean, at UMass and then in Lawrence, Massachusetts, who's now completely converted into this field of functional medicine. The, the recognized leader today, Mark Hyman, trained in family medicine, uh, doesn't uh, use that title, uh, but he should. But they don't associate family medicine with this new health promotion field. Um, I just met a woman who runs a health oriented medical spa in Seattle, treats almost all women uh, who are, uh, and, and focuses on their health and healing. And she trained in family medicine, but if you look on her website, she's board certified in integrative medicine and aesthetic medicine. And, uh, and I, why aren't you using family medicine? Well, it turned out her family medicine residency, which was between 01 and 04, was a very traumatic time in her life. Um, and she wasn't at all healthy during that residency, trying to be in a resident. And even worse yet, she was disciplined in her residency uh, because she was using nutrition instead of drugs to treat chronic disease. And so, you know, her, she didn't have a fondness for family medicine. Well, that's a comment on family medicine and what we can do in family medicine training. So we really need uh, a revolution so we don't lose. I mean, the last thing we can do is start losing people in family medicine to something like functional medicine. I think it's really time to integrate the two. Functional medicine addresses the underlying causes of disease, uses a systems approach to engage the patient and practitioner in a therapeutic relationship to reverse the disease. I mean, it's what we just heard from, from Sarah. Uh, it's about reversing. Now, I went to the American Diabetes Association website a while back, and actually they have a search box in the, and I put in reversing diabetes. Nothing came up. I call it the American Perpetuating Diabetes Association. <laughs> Nothing came up. Now, if you go to the search engine today and put it in, you'll get a bunch of news articles that have been written about this idea of this reversing diabetes, but there are no guidelines, protocols, or anything in there about reversing diabetes. Yeah. I've been reversing my diabetics. As a matter of fact, my part four of my family medicine boards, uh, which I did, was a project taking 19 of my diabetic patients at one point in time, this is years ago, and in six months I had reversed uh, nine of them to be non-diabetic, and that was my practice improvement uh, on my boards uh, uh, by turning them to be non-diabetic. But that's what functional medicine docs do. Functional medicine is different from integrative medicine. Integrative medicine uses a lot of alternative and complementary healing modalities uh, to combine with Western medicine. It's like a lot of what Nick did in his hospital. Functional medicine is, is a different approach to health and health problems by, again, focusing on the cause and using aggressive lifestyle measures. Now, you can say it's, I guess, another type of integrative medicine, but I think it's important not to confuse the two. Um, uh, a lot of integrative medicine is about treating disease problems with herbs and, and whatever other modality you might choose. But the functional medicine, again, goes upstream toward the cause of the health problems. It really is a paradigm shift. Uh, instead of focusing on treating a disease, you address the cause of disease. You're really looking at the whole person. You're using aggressive lifestyle modification. And 
and uh, intends to use nutrition therapy to reduce or eliminate medications. So it's a shift in the focus that we use in healthcare, much like we just heard for Sarah's diabetics. Now the, the recognized founder of functional medicine is a biochemist um, named Jeffrey Bland, based up in Seattle. And he has a book which I recommend, all the books I'm going to show you I recommend, called The, called the Disease Delusion, Conquering the Cause of Chronic Illness for a Healthier, Happier, and Longer Life. Bland is still alive. Um, now, he was criticized, and I think rightfully so, in the early days of functional medicine. He founded it in 1991, the Institute for Functional Medicine, uh, for using way too many supplements. As, a, as an approach, and I think it just came out of his own background. Uh, the functional medicine community has moved away from supplements much more into eating real food and using real food, although supplements are part of the formula of what they might use. But like, for example, you'll find Jeffrey Bland listed in Quackwatch, if you go to the Quackwatch website, around his over-promotion of supplements. He actually was the science director at the Linus Pauling Research Institute. He was very close with Linus Pauling, and they did all that vitamin C work and stuff like that, uh, which is a little bit of his background. He's now, I don't know, maybe 80 years old today, and much of the torch has been passed to the guy who wrote the foreword, uh, Mark Hyman. So why do we have premature disease and death? Why don't we live to our biologic uh, lifespan, which some estimate, or depending on your genetics, might be between 90 and 120 or so? Well, lifestyle is 60 percent of it. The genetic component to premature death and disease in a population is at, is at best at 20 percent, uh, and then bad luck, terrorist attack, and hit by lightning run over by a bus, whatever, uh, is, is another 20%. Uh, rough, but lifestyle, of course, is, is dominant. And what we do in medicine, uh, this came out of a health affairs uh, article, is only a 20% contribution to the overall health outcomes of the community. Where lifestyle, physical environment, social and economic forces make up the rest of what make up healthy communities or population health. I mentioned Daniel Lieberman, highly recommend this book, it came out just a couple of years ago, The Story of the Human Body, Evolution, Health, and Disease. You know, Lieberman, uh, uh, I learned about Lieberman from one of the, my favorite books ever called Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. Born to Run uh, was about the Tara Amara Indians of the Copper Canyons of Mexico, some of the best runners on earth, but it was really about all of us. And Lieberman did the, the best research that showed that Homo erectus, which goes back two and a half million years, uh, we, we survived and why we Homo sapiens are the only hominoids left on Earth because we got through the last ice age uh, about 20,000 years ago uh, because we could run. And uh, we're uniquely gifted to be able to run down our food. Um, you know, we don't, we, when we became not hairy animals, when we shed our hair and our bare skin, it allowed us to sweat, and it allowed us to regulate our temperature while we ran. So you've all seen dogs and horses stop when they get over heat. They cannot take another step, they will not take another step, because they know if they take another step, they're going to collapse. And that's what happens to deer and gazelle and other animals. So primitive man, whether you're the Bushman in Africa or the Tara Mara in, in Mexico, if you spot an animal, uh, you can track, as long as you keep that animal moving, running, by tracking the animal, you don't have to be faster than the animal, we obviously aren't, but if you can spot what you want for dinner and keep it moving, it'll collapse and die within about six hours. And, uh, and that's why these folks can run and run these long distances. And actually, as hunter-gatherers, we weren't scavengers. We were actually runners. And Lieberman and his team at Harvard and a group in Utah were pretty much the pioneers of that understanding. But 
that's just a total aside. He went public because he really uh, is concerned with this book because of the mismatch of our evolutionary bodies with what we did in both the agrarian and then even worse yet, the industrial revolution. It's a great read. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues, Kinder Faisu, who's trained in functional medicine, I mean, she keeps making the point that functional medicine is nothing but good family medicine, and I couldn't agree more. It's a biopsychosocial model that takes uh, a long, you know, get the patient's narrative, all the elements of family medicine is there. Very detailed history, including a full patient and family narrative, origins of any health problems, looks at the patient from multiple perspectives, genetics, upbringing, nutrition, physical activity, stress, social community, sleep, and looks for any causes that may be addressed to restore health. That's essentially functional medicine. That's good family medicine. It takes time. You know, functional medicine practitioners often use about an hour and a half uh, for their intake, although with uh, with uh, online patient histories, you can take a lot of this narrative and digitize it. Uh, there's a guy named Jane Maskell now who just wrote a small book called The Evolution of Medicine in which he's working to use information technology to help make functional medicine a little more efficient. Follow-up visits are typically at least 30 minutes longer. A functional medicine practitioner at the end of the day will typically have seen about eight patients. So. You know, the secret to patient care and healing is time, having time with people. It is a new model. Um, and then the majority of professionals, both teaching and training in functional medicine and family, uh, family physicians. Now, what they found as functional medicine has been, been working its way through since Jeffrey Bland in 91 to today is that the gut is the source of most health problems. And so the general rule in functional medicine, if you want to heal somebody, is to start with the gut. And, uh, and again, the gut means the microbiome and it means the nutrition. So it really lets, it, you know, the Hippocrates of uh, food being our medicine and the Lamotides quote that I used this morning. You know, Thomas Edison predicted functional medicine. The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest in the patient in the care of the human frame, diet, the cause and prevention of disease. He had a vision for functional medicine, oddly enough, his, uh, in his discovery. Nutrition in the body's biochemistry through genetics and epigenetics perform the cornerstone of, of functional medicine. Um, Terry Walls is an internist at the University of Iowa. Uh, her career was interrupted by developing rapidly progressive multiple sclerosis, became disabled. Uh, you can see her pictures on the internet, was in a wheelchair, unable to work, went through conventional therapy without much relief, was put on some of the latest uh, new drugs for MS uh, without relief. Uh, she did her own homework and worked out a way through healthy nutrition and understanding of what causes autoimmune disease and the whole small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, what she calls the paleo principles, uh, reversed her disease. She's completely well, she's back at work, um, no sign of MS. And she helps people with MS all over the world. She has a, a clinic at the University of Iowa uh, for disease reversal of, of MS and anybody with other autoimmune diseases. Uh, this is a book that I highly recommend. Uh, she also has a TED Talk, um, and um, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, just an uh, aside about Terry Walls, uh, she's gay and married to a partner, and they adopted children. And her son, in the last recent election now, he is more famous than his wife because their son, who finished high school, testified in the Iowa legislature uh, in support of gay parents uh, adopting children by talking about how healthy he was and, uh, and what a great mother he had uh, with the two mothers that he happened to have. That's just kind of an interesting aside. You can also see those videos online. 
but the Walls Protocol has a three-layer intensity nutrition along with other lifestyle factors. Very important book. I talked about the big problems of, uh, of nutrition uh, that is dealt with and how body fat drives metabolic syndrome. All the problems that Sarah talked about, you, you, you basically start burning your body fat uh, in a ketogenic diet. Uh, you know, for every 10 pounds of body fat, you make a huge difference in a person's important metabolic numbers. Uh, body fat is very inflammatory in abundance. Uh, it's not inflammatory when it's in the right amount. Um, so it's, uh, and again, the consumption of carbohydrates. I don't really need to belabor this. When you consume high glycemic carbohydrates, you end up, on average, eating 35% more calories. That's why calorie restriction comes into play. When you stop eating the carbohydrates, your calorie consumption you know, just spontaneously will reduce by 30 to 35%. Uh, and, uh, and then all your excess calories are stored as fat. And we talked a little bit about the hunger uh, that we did. And I mentioned this book, which is a 2016 book summarizing very nicely all of the literature that really uh, Sarah just alluded to uh, by, uh, by Mark Hyman. Uh, and she mentioned some of the controlled studies. This was an article in the Annals of Internal Medicine, which was a year-long study of 75 people in each group, one on a low-fat diet, American Heart Association diet, the other on a low-carbohydrate diet, and what happened to them. They both, both groups lost weight, low, low uh, carb people actually lost a little more weight, but the most important striking our finding in this study was what happened to the LDL particles. Um, if you're on a low fat, higher carb diet, even the healthy carbs of the Heart Association, your LDL particles are smaller and more inflammatory. When you go on a low carb, higher fat diet, your LDL particles become big and fluffy and not inflammatory. And that's why she referred to you know, the advanced lipid testing, it isn't about that calculated LDL number, it's what are those LDL particles look like. Uh, you know, the LDL is a, is a calculated number in a lipid profile, and it's only a volume number. What she mentioned about that LDLP, LDL particles being 2,000, even though the LDL is only 70, <coughs> but that's because it's a volume and they have a bunch of small particles which are inflammatory. When you go uh, low carb, your LDL particles become less inflammatory. And uh, so for the same LDL value, there's actually fewer LDL particles because they're larger and they're fluffier and they're not inflammatory. Um, so what are they? It's the grains. You know, I call them the three sins that I try to deal with in my population. Uh, I get them all, I get them off of as much grains as possible, uh, uh, both mainly for the carb load. Uh, rice is the one I mentioned earlier, not inflammatory. Corn and whole kernel corn is not terribly inflammatory. Uh, uh, you know, high fructose corn syrup is one of the worst things we could possibly consume because of what, how it's metabolized in the liver. I mean, it's inducing fatty liver in children. Now, the sweets are, are the candies and the ice cream and, and other sweets you've got to get people off of. And, um, you know, the, the soda story, again, is a, is a horrible story for America, you know, big business. You know, sugar, table sugar, uh, and sh sugar farming, whether it be from sugar beets or sugar cane, uh, has turned out to be relatively expensive, especially with American labor wages. So almost all sugar is now grown outside of America. And uh, so how to kind of keep the sugar, if you will, in America, uh, the, the soda companies and others who make sweets have turned to corn. And they, you know, that high fructose corn syrup is comparable in terms of sweetness and taste. So when you look now at, 
at all the beverages, the sodas, instead of sugar, it'll say high fructose corn syrup. Well, fructose in that form uh, induces fatty liver very quickly. And so we're actually getting fatty liver disease in children drinking sodas. Robert Lustig at UC San Francisco uh, is really the, the champion uh, and has written the articles and again condemning the food industry and wanting to outlaw high fructose corn syrup, kind of like outlawing trans fats. You know, there are unhealthy fats, especially the trans fats. And, uh, and it's interesting, if you go to the market today, you'll actually see Pepsi cans that'll say made with real sugar. They're, they're trying to sell the Pepsi, telling you at least this doesn't have high fructose corn syrup. So something to be sensitive to. And then, of course, we got to watch the alcohol intake. Alcohol is a sugar. Um, a lot of alcoholic beverages like mixed drinks and cocktails are very, very high in carbohydrates. You know, a, a margarita is a massive carbohydrate load. And, uh, and so you've got to uh, limit your, your alcohol to something like one glass of red wine if you want something healthy, for example, uh, but not going beyond and certainly avoiding the, uh, the high carbohydrate mixed drinks. So if you're going to go low carb, those are really kind of the th big three categories. Uh, glycemic load is the total amount of carb in the food. The goal is to have less than 50 grams. Sarah was even talking about 20 to 30 grams of carbohydrates. Uh, if you can go that low, that's great. As she mentioned, we don't need carbohydrates at all. It's hard to avoid them completely won't if you're eating fruit and vegetables, which we should uh, definitely all be eating. And I talked a bit about the prolamin proteins. Gluten is part of a, uh, a name called prolamin proteins that come in grains. Uh, the casein protein in cow's milk uh, causes an inflammatory condition for a lot of people. Uh, it's the basis of infant colic, even infant colic and breastfed mothers who are consuming a lot of cow's milk. Uh, it's the basis for all those baby rashes that we see. I mean, what we do to babies in this country is, uh, is just really alarming. As somebody who did OB for 18 years and dealt with all these problems, is, you know, their first food is, is cereal at four to six months. And, uh, uh, and of course, the, uh, uh, the cow's milk formulas that dominate when women aren't nursing. Uh, but even women who are nursing and consuming a lot of cow's milk can cause some inflammatory proteins even in their own breast milk. And, uh, and this stuff is now known. A lot of the best studies are done in Scandinavia and other places. There's a, there's a you know, it's an interesting com uh, comment on American even nutritional research. Uh, our nutritional research centers and Minnesota and Tufts and various places are heavily influenced by our food industry in America in terms of funding, what they will and won't do in terms of studies. So you got to look beyond the U.S. for a lot of this data. Um, so the diseases associated with the inflammatory proteins. I mean, I can reverse all my GERD patients, get them off their PPIs by getting them off the inflammatory proteins. Irritable bowel disease goes away. You can reverse Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and other colitis all by getting off inflammatory proteins. It takes a little time, a few months, but it works. Autoimmune problems is why I have hypothyroidism. I, mean, I grew up in the wheat fields in Ohio and ate bread heavily into my early 60s. I don't know. But no family history of hypothyroidism, but all of a sudden I became autoimmune hypothyroid at age 57. But the inflammatory arthritis is, and again, multiple sclerosis, but all of those problems can be ameliorated. Uh, I'll talk about David Perlmutter, the neurologist uh, with a degree in nutrition, with autism, essential tremor, Parkinson's disease, and, and, and dementia, Alzheimer's disease are all associated. With, our mouth, with inflammatory proteins in our mouth Now, even in species that live a long time, like us, like elephants and others, 
we're the only species that gets Alzheimer's disease. You know, and they've looked for it. I mean, they can measure dementia in an animal, and they can look for it, and uh, it doesn't exist. I have a very vain way of, uh, you know, it was easy for me to give up wheat because I suffered with acne for about 35 years. And if you read chapter 12 of William Davis' Wheat Belly, I learned that my, the damn boot was causing my acne. And, he, and the data, the references are all there. And I thought, shit, you know, because I was waiting for my acne to go away. You know, I kept getting acne in my 50s. And then, sure enough, when the acne went away, I developed rosacea. You know, later adult acne. And, uh, and uh, if I have wheat, the next morning I have, I have uh, a, a tender reddish changes in my nose, around my nose. Uh, if I stay completely away from these inflammatory proteins, I don't have any rosacea. So it's pretty easy for me to not eat meat because I'll pay the consequences uh, pretty rapidly in terms of an inflammatory reflex. It's not a, uh, it's, a, it's an inflammatory reaction. It's not an IgE-mediated reaction. So when we use that word allergy, we're not talking about IgE-mediated allergy. We're talking about an inflammatory effect on the body that's direct. I have my patients uh, tell me that their seasonal allergies have gone away. They don't have that, quote, spring or fall hay fever and asthma they used to have. Um, why? Uh, it's, you know, wow. I mean, we always blame the environment, but the body's inflammatory reaction in terms of allergies are deeply affected by these inflammatory proteins. This is all part of what the functional medicine people know and apply. And uh, this is just kind of a symbol of this phenomenon where uh, we have tight junctions, certainly in our cold. We don't have tight junctions in our small intestine. <coughs> These inflammatory proteins uh, cause what is being called leaky gut, and uh, but it's, it's it's an inflammatory reaction where these uh, these materials get through the tight junctions and into the bloodstream, and it's the those proteins, gliadins in particular, that was one of the dominant proteins in gluten, gets into the bloodstream and causes an inflammatory reaction. It's not an IgE-mediated immune reaction. That's why you don't have IgE-mediated changes uh, in, uh, in people with gluten sensitivity. In celiac, they do, uh, and you can measure it, but you're not going to find it in people with other gluten sensitivities, for example. But uh, these proteins cause direct inflammatory response throughout the body, depending on where your vulnerabilities are going to be. Um, this was the book written in 2011. Uh, no, actually, it was a plain wheat belly. He followed it up three years later. You know, Davis, along with these other guys, uh, you know, Davis was a, a was a modern day Atkins. He was an interventional cardiologist in Milwaukee um, who was fat and type two diabetic and really unhealthy, and, uh, and decided to do something about it, and, uh, and ended up focusing on the problems of grains and and the double whammy, the high glycemic load, the amylopectin A that is in whole wheat bread and white bread and all the others. Whole wheat bread's just as bad, if not a little worse, than white bread, by the way. So it isn't about just being white. The glycemic index of whole wheat bread is 72 and white bread at 69. So it's, a, it's not any better. But you know, he focused on that, obviously he reversed his own disease and stuff and got healthy uh, and came out with a wheat belly, but then he went online and the wisdom of the crowd, the Sir Wiki effect of the wisdom of the crowd started teaching him more things, plus he found that not everybody responded to just giving up grains. And so he began to learn why there were non-responders and some of the nuances and complexities of this, which they go into a lot of functional medicine, like thyroid disease, for example, or other things that get in the way of having a full response to going on a healthy plan. And he describes this a lot in his follow-up book. David Perlmutter, a, a neurologist based in Naples, Florida, on the clinical faculty at the University of Miami, 
has a master's degree in nutrition. He thinks he's the only neurologist in the country with a degree in nutrition. And he uh, wrote Brain Brain, which made him pretty famous. The, uh, uh, clearly showing, I mean, that he's using the data. This was even published in the New England Journal. If you have, you know, uh, many of you have heard that type 2 diabetes is, uh, is a type of Alzheimer's, is a cause of Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and, and uh, you triple your likelihood at any age as a senior, you know, over the age of 50. But you triple your likelihood of having Alzheimer's disease at any age, depending on what your blood sugar is around. Uh, and if you're in the diabetes range, you triple your risk. If you're a pre-diabetic, you double your risk. I use this with patients a lot. Sorry. You're taking away my slides. Which one are you on? Well, I can look at the desktop. I'm on the functional medicine and the medicine. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a good book, but as follow-up, this is, this is a great book. Uh, because it brings the gut microbiome, a lot of what Dan talked about earlier, into it. And the power of the gut microbes to heal and protect your brain for life. Um, and it's the most recent book. Uh, his chapter on autism is phenomenal from my perspective. He's convinced that we induce autism in pregnancy and early infancy uh, through malnutrition. And, and the evidence behind it is compelling. It's not the end of the story, but it's compelling. But he starts from autism, uh, Tourette's, and others. He treats these patients with uh, fecal transplantation. Often has to go outside the United States to get it. He also has a very aggressive other you know, rehab the gut microbiome quickly. But he basically treats the gut to fix the brain. Uh, and a whole host of neurologic conditions. But if you want to go to the cause, the cause of these problems uh, are our malnutrition. And he makes a very, very compelling case for how to have a healthy brain through healthy nutrition. Um, Jeff Bolek is at Ohio State. Stephen Finney is an MD, PhD from the University of California, Davis, just retired. Uh, they wrote The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living, which is a book for healthcare professionals. They followed that up with The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Performance, which they wrote for athletes, all about basically being a ketogenic diet. Uh, much of what Sarah just said, these are, these are terrific books. Um, Justin and Erica Sonnenberg are husband, wife, microbiologists, in uh, the Department of Biology at Stanford. And uh, they're considered two of the leading gut microbiome scientists in the country. And they went public uh, just a couple of years ago with their book, The Good Gut, uh, which is a good deep dive into the microbiome of the gut and, and how that makes uh, us for health. Gerard Mullen is a gastroenterologist at Johns Hopkins. So what you're finding is some pretty heavy-hitting academics are now realizing this. Mullen, uh, as a pre-med, weighed over 300 pounds. He was told that he probably wouldn't get into medical school unless he became healthier. And he kind of took that to heart and studied nutrition, uh, lost a lot of weight, and has kept an intense interest in nutrition. Uh, but his book now, going public, is, uh, is basically how to develop a healthy gut microbiome and how that's going to affect uh, your health in many, many different ways. It's really reinforcing uh, the work of Brain Maker and some of the others. Um, Robin Chutkin is an interesting woman. She's a gastroenterologist and who was at Georgetown when she wrote this book uh, and, uh, and now runs a women's health She's a women's health gastroenterologist in Washington, D.C., uh, fixing women's gut problems. She became well known with a book, Gut Bliss. Uh, women tend to like that title. Um, I listen to all these books, by the way, and then I buy them as references, but I have a book in my car, so I, you know, I don't have all this time to read these books, so I just listen to them all the time, and I find that very efficient. Yeah, I think she uses the word bloat a thousand times in that book. And you know, as a man, I never think of myself as bloated, but I guess women think they're bloated 
it all the time. But anyway, we know what you're talking about. She, <laughs> she will ban the bloat. And, uh, but her follow-up book, The Microbiome Solution, A Radical New Way to Heal Your Body from the Inside Out, just reinforces everything I've said. So all these books are coming out this decade. I mean, this is a remarkable uh, decade of understanding. And, and all of these books are becoming you know, New York Times bestseller uh, type books. So the public is really learning. We need to learn this. And this is, again, these are all core functional medicine. I have a book. I'll be selling it tomorrow, actually, or signing copies if you want it. It's on Amazon, A Doctor's Journey to Healthy Nutrition and Greater Wellness. I have a breakfast, lunch, and dinner pictures on the book with me writing a while ago. Um, I think our, the, the biggest difference between me and these books is I'm, I'm more humble, and I give all of them a lot of credit. Most of the book is me writing book reviews and articles about all these other authors and summarizing. It's only 100 pages long, so it doesn't have a lot of fun. I didn't have to meet the, meet the requirements of a big commercial publisher. We, you know, we all know about probiotics. We talked about prebiotics, which are far more important. Uh, we got this unhealthy body of water near the Coachella Valley where I work called the Salton Sea, and it's dying and all that kind of stuff. And I, we use the analogy that taking some prebiotics is like taking buckets of fresh water to throw them in the Salton Sea to make it healthier. And uh, where uh, prebiotics is basically putting things into the Salton Sea that are just going to ripple through and, and, and help purify the Salton Sea. Prebiotics are feeding the 100 trillion uh, friends that you've got down there. Uh, supplements confuse the body, Colin Campbell. Uh, Gerard Mullen calls supplements taking a few people out of the symphony orchestra and asking them to play beautiful music. Uh, the symphony, you can't do it. Uh, the only big exception is vitamin D. Vitamin D is a hormone that makes our body work right. Evolution did not give us a mechanism to have vitamin D as a senior. It doesn't convert in skin, mold skin. So. Whether seniors are out in the sun all day, they often have very low vitamin D levels. Vitamin D prevents cancer, keeps bones healthy, uh, has hundreds of uses in the body. It's like a hormone, not a vitamin. And uh, it's the one vitamin supplement that all adults should probably be taking over the age of 50. I take 5,000 units of vitamin D every the only other supplement as a runner I do for prevention, not treatment, but prevention, is that I do use a glucosamine chondroitin MSN mix based on limited data. It doesn't make arthritis better, but it probably has some benefits. But that's about it. Uh, other elements of functional medicine, uh, you know, in terms of the time, and, uh, and uh, if, if family physicians integrated functional medicine and had billable diagnoses, you could indeed use the patient's insurance. Uh, what's holding us back? Reluctance to adopt a scientific revolution. Certainly the food industry is, uh, is against us and it's, uh, it's you know, pervasive in terms of the, what the influence may be and in terms of articles. The lack of randomized controlled trials. There's not a lot of funding to do the definitive lack of controlled trials, but we, family medicine could add a lot to the research. And of course, it's a huge culture change. But the change has happened. The Cleveland Clinic program, the FPs that are training, people are voting with their feet. And so uh, I highly recommend that we integrate functional medicine. I recommend the one-week course applying functional medicine to clinical practice. You can join the Institute for Functional Medicine for $150 and get on the mailing list. I think it's well worth it. So thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.